Hello everybody, welcome to my channel and welcome to this tutorial on how I modified my Holtzbrook Arbica 5 Star Felling Axe. This is quite an axe and I'll take you through step by step on all the things I did both the head and the handle to make this axe my own. You can do all of this in your own garage. It's not difficult, it just takes a little bit of creative vision and some stick to itness So enjoy the video. Hello Axe fans, I am in Axe Nirvana right now. Axe Valhalla, all right, because my five star Arvika filling axe has arrived. Manufactured by Holtzbrook, Arvikas have a long and prestigious history in um, the lore of axe making. And I brought some of my old Arvikas out here, take a look at this pattern and what you can buy today, right, for a very reasonable price for this much axe. I am so excited, I'm so excited. There's the Arvika 5 Star revealed without the wax coating. And you can see what you have here are some interesting, uh, unique features about this hack. One, it's covered in lacquer. It is covered in lacquer. And it has a very rough ground, uh, uneven uh, edge edge angle there. Now you, would, you, you could open this up and take this out and say, this is an Arvika? This is the best there is? And I'm gonna say, I absolutely accept the condition of this axe out of the box, and I'll tell you why. Number one, the lacquer coat. So the head of this axe is gr ground finish, and you, some call it a satin finish, um, but it is a it is a ground surface, uh, probably a belt sander, no doubt a belt sander, and. From my experience, it's not that fine. It's not that fine. It looks amazing, and I love it. And I've tried to do this myself with Restoring Axis. Like, I like this look. The thin parallel lines, clean, clean metal. I love it. You know what? It is hard to maintain, like, once you have it done. All those little ridges are very susceptible to being scratched and bumped. They really are. And so, you know, I put a lot of effort into getting this finish. And then you just put it on the rack and like there's little marks now just from the rack and it's just all that exposed ridge that's in there so I think wisely to preserve this finish to the end user here's a, there's a fly um, they put a hard lacquer on it which has protected it this is great all right I can remove the lacquer and I'll get that great finish number two um, the rather sloppy edge finish Certainly not Holtz Brooks's finest work. Okay, and you could say that's crap. I have three other Tasmanian pattern axes. Two are vintage, and one, the Helco, is new. And I haven't done anything to these. They, well, no, the, the top two have been restored. But my point is that um, I'm pretty sure that these axe heads had close to the original geometry from the pattern, you know, before they were worked on. Like that was, you know, it was like they had all their toe and all their heel. So, um, one thing about this pattern is that it always comes with a really thick, beefy uh, bevel. Like, it's really thick. It was designed specifically for Australian hardwood trees like Spotted Gum and Jura and trees that I know nothing about and none of us in North America, Canada know anything about. And it was a pattern really designed for them and a professional working class that would modify their tools out of pride and necessity. Like they would work on these tools. You got an ax, you knew how to sharpen it. People around you had strong opinions about how to sharpen it. People had a lot of experience about what worked or what didn't work on the trees they were using. See, that kind of knowledge was passed down. And so it's a pattern that just basically comes out of the box if you're going to be loyal to the history of it, um, needing work. It really does. I know that's not just marketing bullshit. I mean, that's like every Tasmanian pattern I ever get. It's it's the same. They're like. Real work needs to be done on that edge by the user to make it their own. And so, you know, the fault here is with anything is with tradition, because this is a traditional uh, axeman's axe. So this is a very serious axe, and uh, it demands, out of respect of nothing else, um, a dedicated and well done tune-up uh, to make it everything it can be and what I want it to be. So, time to do that. I've been impressed uh, with the chopping performance of a full convex grind, which is uh, just the long, long, sloping, even uh, 
convex angle down to the very edge. All right, so you don't really have um, a bevel and a relieved bevel. It's just sloping all the way down. Um, several axe patterns are great at this, and it just performs um, amazingly well. The Tasmanian's one of them. So, and that fortunately is something I can do on my bench sander, I hope, with a lot of care and a lot of respect, because you cannot, you cannot mess this up. And it's easy to do. makes sense uh, you go for a really exaggerated uh, gradual grind and you're just sloping the convex angle closer and closer to the edge um, if that makes any sense you're just working away from back to forward to the edge so I think I'll stop here for the night and I've done all I really want to do and so what I've tried to do is just really even out that convex from all the way back, you know, two and a half inches maybe, just all the way back, trying to get bring that all the way down, saving the edge for the very end, you know, the very end. Okay, I got both sides through like, I guess the first pass. Really happy with how lucky I am. Um, just a lot of luck. Um, I'm not overshooting where I wanted to go. And so, started on the back and went to the front. I used Gorilla Tape to kind of set out you know how far back on the cheeks i wanted to grind and not, not to touch the logo um so keep the sides even okay and then as you get closer you get closer you get closer um you got to check constantly um from the toe end a lot you know you really got to eyeball it to see if you're if you're bringing those bevels in evenly or whether they're kind of wavy or something you gotta you gotta look at both ends because they can you know you could go hard on one side, not the other, and, and it kind of gets off. And so you kind of got to eyeball it in and bring it together. And I finally brought it down. And so check it. But now I'm kind of in the final stages where I'm really, really close um, to that, to where I want to be. And so I'm using a permanent marker to identify just that's, that's where I want to grind to get right in there. Okay. So super excited. Yeah. Taking a lot of. A lot of careful, um, you know, check five times, grind once kind of technique right now. Okay, nope, I could not get it done like I wanted on uh, the bench sander. It was not happening. So, being extremely careful with this and just going to do it by hand. I'm going to use stones and I'm going to shape that down and get the angles I want. And uh, sure enough, you know, when I started, uh, started in on a very coarse stone, there was a kind of a little ridge, you know, maybe maybe an eighth to a quarter of an inch from the edge. It just it was a little little ridge, kind of followed the edge all the way around from the grinding. So, gonna work that out with some stones.
So the only thing more boring than watching paint dry is watching somebody hand grind metal. <laughs> Takes forever after several hours we're finally there. Uh, 23 degree full convex very nice. Tried it out on the chopping station and it's a brute. Just a destroyer of wood. So now we need to make it pretty. It's always tough in the lighting in my workshop to see. So the first step was to take flap wheels and give the surface a very even, careful treatment from 60 to 120 up to 240 grit using flap wheels. And that brings back the even satin finish. All right, makes it look nice, nice and even. And just don't even get close to the edge if you can even help it. You just leave the edge, it's a whole different project. So I got it up to 240 grit. Now to take it on to even something higher. I wanted to go for something that was different, but uh, I don't know, true to the spirit and form of, of this great, great axe. And so we've got a 23 degree full convex grind. We've got a nice, nice 800 grit satin semi, semi mirror finish. It's not a mirror finish. 800 grit, got lots of the striation going the right way. It's just uh, turned out really nice. And boy, it's sharp as hell. In fact, it's somewhat a fluid sharp. I kind of let myself go with this one to just take it all the way. No axe needs to be this sharp. This is not a requirement for any high performance axe, this kind of sharp. Axe. But um, in this case, I just want to see what we could do. Reshaping handle is definitely a weakness in my bench setup. This is the best I got. You know, I got all kinds of stuff. Protecting the head, should have done this before I did the head, but I was so excited. So I've got this set up in here and we're gonna go at it with rasp. We're gonna go at it with sandpaper and we're just gonna try to thin this handle down into a beautiful classic shape. Um, hopefully it makes even swing a little better. <laughs> So what the heck we try to do when we quote thin a handle and um, it, it is hard to sort of uh, envision unless you've uh, swung an axe with you know a really thin curvy maybe a handmade handle which it's usually where you can find um, kind of the old thin thinner uh, designs of axe handles you know there's axe handle carvers out there and you know for money they'll make you an amazing handle here's one Ryan Lambrecht, right, Massachusetts, made that Red Warrior handle on the left, and or on the bottom. And, um, you know, so I'm kind of, as I thin down the Arvika handle, um, I'm inspired by designs like this. You know, you bring a lot off the neck and the shoulder there, and then down in the palm square where you grip it, 
You really thin that to a good feeling, all right, in the hand. Um, it makes you more accurate. It lightens up the axe. Uh, it was a good thing for fatigue control. Um, they look great. So, you know, there it is. You know, I'm gonna go get a picture of an old old axe that just looks speaks to you. It looks beautiful and you know, and the rasp and sandpaper in hand, uh, you know, bring that uh, modern handle uh, closer to those more elegant designs. <laughs> A little tip on Mora knife scraping. Um, instead of just jamming it in like a scraper dunk, because it'll make, you know, a knife mark. Um, you go in like this and then you roll it. That seems to be the way to go. I'm using it as a good scraper. You can roll it. And then by the end, yeah, it's scraping really good. I know, it's right. What can't you do with a good mortar? I don't know. All right, I powered through that in two sessions of a couple hours each to reshape the handle. It's it's hard work. <laughs> I'm not very good at it, but I have a lot of examples to look at and to, you know, work with. And so we slimmed this down in a way, you know, to make it a little different. And, and I, I have to say, you know, slimming your own handle, you really get dialed in. It really is cool. This feels amazing. This is a huge axe. That feels awesome. So now we're gonna finish the handle because I I just like axes all glammed out. So we're gonna we're gonna do it. So I like a painted handle. I do. I just like the way they look. I think they look traditional, and I like the feel when you use good paints. I like how it does feel on the grip and how it wears over time. So for the Arvika, we're gonna use something pretty special. It's black linseed oil paint. All right. Linseed oil paint is basically, you know, uh, colored pigments suspended in linseed oil, which is what, or one of the oils you use to traditionally treat uh, a tool handle. And so it's the perfect kind of oil for the wood. And uh, this particular brand of paint has really high quality pigments that I've been impressed with. It's, it's definitely a flat black. It's not a glossy black, but it's a flat black. And if applied right, it takes a long time to dry. It really does. It's kind of a pain in the ass. But uh, when it's all said and done, it's worth it, and you can oil it with uh, boiled linseed oil on top, you know, for the rest of the life of the axe. So summer is great for BLO and um, linseed oil paint. Um, really is a pain in the ass. You gotta let it dry thoroughly for 24 hours. You just gotta give it a day. I've tried to accelerate that best I could, but give it a day. And the reason going through all this, you know, hassle is that it, it's, it's basically Gives you the feel of a very well-oiled axe. That's what it feels like, which is the goal. It feels awesome, and it gives great grip, and it wears like iron, you know. So, I guess it's just worth it. So, in the meantime, while the BLO paint dries, we're gonna start um, tongue oil and turpentine mix as the way to oil the head. And I like to do it this way so that the Oil starts running down the grains, and if it needs the oil, man, it's amazing how much goes in. Seriously. And you'll see it pop out down on the grain below. It's a pretty cool effect. You just got to keep doing this over and over and over. And it soaks in. It'll start slow, kind of saturate. So for uh, illustrative purposes, I've been going hard at the eye for about two days, and you can see it's seeping through slowly but surely. It's seeping through. Back, you can even see it. You see it sort of leaching now out down the grain. You can see spots, and there's even one spot that's come out. I hope you can see that. Uh oh, focus. There we go. Can you see that? Is it focused? It's not really focused. 
Okay, that's BLO. I mean, that's tongue oil and, and um, turpentine leaching out, you know, 12 inches from the top. It gets down there. So I think while we're waiting literally for paint to dry between layers, or coats rather, we're gonna go ahead and start to treat the, uh, the rest of the haft. And we're gonna use very fine Swedish pine tar. Yes, Swedish tar. Why not? It's a Arvika, so Swedish tar, that's the way to go. Should give it a really rich, dark color. Almost there. I'm gonna apply it pretty hot. Really hot. That way it'll even coat better. All right. It's warm. Some people will dilute this, you know, with an oil, linseed oil or something. Also good. Also good. And you get this base layer on here. This hot pine tar. And go for a nice even coat. It's sticky. Uh, it's sticky. So it's good to have a warm environment and really thin it out. Really thin it out. It will dry faster, thin, coat easier. You notice I'm not taping anything up here. I think we're just going to eyeball this. All right. My black's not good enough, not good yet. So the end here could be tricky. Paper cups, not ideal, not ideal. Not ideal for distribution. Uh, the linseed oil paint is pretty dry. It's pretty dry. You know, I'm not gonna smudge it or ruin the lines or anything, but it's not entirely dry. But I don't wanna wait. I wanna get this pine tar going and I can oil it more, right? I can get this done. We're so close now. There, look at that. Really golden, not quite brown, darker than tan pine tar. That's just a unique color. No expensive, but boy, does that look good. Well, there you go. Uh, Holtzbrook Arvika, five star, four and a half pound Tasmanian pattern felling axe, 32 inch hickory haft. Um, what an axe! That's all I can say. So much axe. I made it for a user, even though I glammed it up, right? It was made to be used. I've taken it out and tried it out. That is a lot of axe for your money. Seriously, a lot of axe for your money. And this whole project start to finish was actually one week. You know, working on it every day. It was meant to be a worker, really, honestly. It's not just the wall hanger. So I've taken it out and man, the balance is fantastic and the power is incredible. And, when you, it, and it can take a very aggressive angle. It really can. You can. I could probably go down to 20 on, on the convex, and, uh, and it would hold up fine. Hard steel, high quality, cuts great. What a great axe. Love it. So, hey, you can do this yourself. It's all here. It's easy, it's easy stuff. Just uh, follow those tips, and you'll do great. Thanks. Like and subscribe for more axe goodness.